So this is DC, uh, Washington DC, the tale of two cities, utilizing the wisdom of nature, uh, collective work um, to rebuild and heal communities. And that term, actually the wisdom of nature, I got when I was um, in grad school up at UVM and one of my kind of favorite teachers up there named Kaylin Two Trees, um, she, that, was, that was a term that I'm, I'm borrowing from her. She would always talk about the wisdom of nature and how you know nature is always and will continue to always be um, a teaching tool and how we can kind of tap into that um, and utilize that within whatever the work that we do. For me, um, you know, I do it in kind of community-based organizing and, and, and building kind of work. So, so I'm from Washington, D.C., and I, I think it's important to acknowledge kind of the original um, people who, uh, who were once on the land and, and who continue to still occupy this space. Um, and so in DC, uh, folks have been to DC, you know, it's pretty much centered in between the Potomac River and the Anacostia River. And the Potomac River kind of will take you down to Virginia and they both flow into the Chesapeake Bay, which eventually flows into the Atlantic Ocean. But the original people um, from DC were the Anacostia people, the Piscataway people and the Potomac people. The majority of those groups, the, the, the folks who did survive uh, kind of European colonization they were pushed down into Southern Maryland, uh, different parts of PG County and Charles County. Um, and so I think that's, you know, I just want to acknowledge them because their story is kind of intertwined in, in some of the work that I do. And so this is just an old map um, of John Smith that John Smith created, uh, just kind of outlining uh, the different, you know, nations that existed in the DC area. Cool, so let's jump into it. So when people typically come to my town, which I call DC, it's, it's usually some, most people come to Washington. And DC, like, and that's why the title says, The Tale of Two Cities. Within this small kind of tiny uh, town that I live in, there's, there's, there's two cities that exist. You have Washington, you know, where the president resides, where um, the Capitol is, where the Lincoln Memorial is, where the Washington Monument is, where laws are passed all, you know, all types of political things are happening. And then you have the district or DC, the District of Columbia. And that is everything kind of outside the capital that's pretty much forgotten. And when people come to Washington, they very rarely set foot into the district, you know, but there's a vibrant culture and there's many of people that, that are living, um, that are fighting and struggling for liberation. And, and, and many people are just fighting and struggling just to sustain and to survive within the district. And so I, I think it's, I feel that it's, it's super important to kind of paint that picture of the two worlds that live in that that are that exist right in DC. Um, I guess we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, and so we we'll just move forward just to add more context. And just to add more context, so Black DC, because it's the tale of two cities, the 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 health disparities with Black Washingtonians are higher than than our white counterparts. You know whether it be different forms of cancer, whether it's breast cancer, you know, prostate cancer, uh, cervical cancer. Um, and we saw these, these, and we saw this all over the country, but we definitely saw it, you know, in DC where all these pre-existing kind of inequities were exacerbated during COVID. But this is just an example of, um, you know, some of the disparities that black men and black women and black children uh, face in the city. And this contest kind of leads up to where I kind of found myself trying to figure out, you know, what can I do, um, trying to play my part, my little role. And this is another example. Um, and I pulled all this information from uh, Georgetown University, uh, a study that they did. Um, and so the side of town where I work, I work in Ward 8, Washington, D.C. So that would be considered uh, Southeast D.C. That's east of the Anacostia River. And the Anacostia River is named after the indigenous people that once occupied the land. Um, there's, no, there's no hospital that has a trauma unit. So there's, there's no hospital that women on that side of town, over, over like 99.9% .9 of the women are black women have the, uh, the capability to, um, to have a safe birth. Uh, there's no hospital for that. There's no hospital that has a trauma unit on that side of town. And that side of town has the highest um, incidences of gun violence, you know, so people being murdered. And so there's a lot of like disparities and you can kind of, you know, kind of see these things. Ah, go back. And this is just the last slide just to kind of highlight 
um, some of these things. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that 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 are um, unfortunately dying from pretty much uh, preventable diseases. You know, preventable diseases, whether it be diabetes, heart disease, obesity. You know, some of these things are 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 are, are preventable. And so, kind of growing up in the city, uh, moving away for a little bit, going to school in North Carolina, spending some time in Vermont, spending some time in some other places. Um, this is where I, I kind of found myself on the backdrop of all those things, right? I was raised up in the city during the 80s, during the uh, 90s, during the crack epidemic. And so I've always been a person who was raised to like, you know, what can I do? Um, like, you know, what can I do for, for my people, for my community? And through many a past, some that we'll talk about today, it brought me to here. And so we put this together. So I, I founded an organization that's at the top, it's called Soulful City. Uh, Soulful is a, I'm not going, so I found an organization called Soulful. I founded, an, a co-founded another organization called South Eats. And I'm also, I guess they would tell me to say, I'm, I'm the co-founder of a, a Black Farmers Collective called the Black Dirt Farm Collective. What I've tried to do is create a um, interdependent kind of network or system, like a triangle, like kind of like the triangle offense, where all three of these organizations, and, and it's just not me, that's why it says our collective work, but many of people work with, and they all kind of flow together. They all kind of operate in different spaces, but the spaces overlap, right? And they all take care of each other, almost like um, if people are into uh, gardening or farming and things of that nature, if you were to go out to the forest, you know, it's all these different, you know, ecosystems that are operating independently, but they all work together. And that was kind of like the concept that I wanted to kind of take uh, with my work. And so we'll jump right into it. So Soulful was an organization that I started back in, I, I wanna say at this point, maybe like 2016, 2017. I wanted to figure out a way to get um, African-Americans in DC back into like growing food, back into agriculture, back into kind of these ancestral practices that we had at one time, but we left behind or we forgot about, you know? And so, uh, that was soulful. And I, I wanted to come up with a word that described the feeling when I was just getting into gardening that described it. And so soulful is a word, it's an adjective um, that describes the feeling when the mind, body, and spirit is connected with the earth. And that's how I was feeling when I was first when agriculture, when 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 just the work of, of working with the land got into me, you know, soulful was, was like the feeling. And so I wanted to kind of create that and describe that. And I wanted to be able to share that with others and use it as a as an organizing tool. And so we jump right into it. And so as we're talking about Soulful, one of the things that, that I did with Soulful in the big, very beginning was that I began to work with the youth. And so one of the actually, unfortunately last year in 2020, one of the young guys that I worked with named Kareem Palmer, um, he was murdered. Uh, and he, he, he had been one of the people that had been through Soulful, he had been with South Eats, he had been with Black Dirt Farm Collective, so I just wanted to make sure I, I acknowledge him. He was killed, um, he was kind of murdered by, by, by just by the society that's been created in D.C., for lack of a better term, in the society that, that all of us or many people in D.C. are struggling to push against. But he's a representation of, of Soulful and kind of the programming that we put together for young folks where we could kind of give them this uh, holistic experience bouncing between Soulful, South Eats, and, and Black Dare Farm Collective. And so this is kind of like the mission and vision of Soulful, and then I'll break down to how we kind of put the mission and vision um, to play. And so we seek to bring justice to communities and heal the sacred relationship between communities of African descent and Mother Earth. So in DC, many there's many people from DC maybe 80, 90 years ago, whose grandparents migrated from North Carolina, from Virginia, from South Carolina, and they had forgot they had left, you know, a lot of them, our grandparents were sharecroppers, they were tenant farmers, and they were trying to escape pretty much white supremacist terrorism in the South. And they moved up to uh, what many would, conceive, would, would, would um, perceive as now or detailed now as a false dream of, of the North. And DC obviously is right on the borderline, you know, uh, of the North and the South. And so they, they left that, you know, they left all these, these ways of knowing, of healing, of being, right, and adopted a, a new urban lifestyle. I recognize that from talking to my elders, from doing research, that because this, um, 
because there was this, this blockage and this break with information because people, a lot of our ancestors confused what happened to us on the land with the land itself, if that makes sense to you all. And so they left that behind. What I wanted to do was bring that back together. And I want to bring, I want to bridge that gap and reconnect us back to the land and reconnect us back to a different way of doing things. And so that's kind of how I developed the, the mission of Soulful, the mission and vision of Soulful. And so we dive right into kind of working with, this is just a, a, a picture from a few years ago of myself and some of my community partners um, of this is a, this is a, is a compost cooperative that I co-founded with an organization called Hustlers to Harvesters, where we were working with formerly incarcerated people to build out their own small business. And this small compost cooperative is a uh, kind of smaller project that's inside of a larger project that is called the Dick Street Garden. And so essentially what we did was we worked to reclaim an underutilized piece of property in the community and build it out into this pretty, I would say this pretty amazing kind of garden space that's operated by people who were formerly incarcerated, um, who, who kind of got wrapped up in the war on drugs. And so, we were kind of using this to revitalize, revitalize community and revitalize the space. And that's, that was, this is an example of the highest peak or at that, at that point, the highest peak of what Soulful is, is where we can kind of take stuff from the past, take the wisdom of people who are, um, who have been forgotten about and, and beat down in society, and then to take the wisdom of, of nature and bring it all together and build out these community spaces. And this is just, um, I added this quote down here because this quote, um, if, if you all are familiar with agroecology, um, and I'll dive deeper into agroecology, this, we, we applied an agroecological lens onto like the urban kind of gritty context that we work in. And so we're pulling from many things and blending them all together into something new. And um, yeah. So kind of moving forward, this is jumping into Southeast. And Southeast is a worker owned food cooperative that I co-founded with uh, two of my, my good friends where we wanted to, we were already growing food. We were already, but we work in communities that are food insecure. We know that we don't have the capital to, you know, start a grocery co-op. Co we don't have the resources to start a healthy corner store or anything like that. So we had to figure out, you know, we're trying to build a new culture of health in our community. And how can we kind of draw from our ancestral past and build something new. And so we, I put this picture up here just to represent, just to show that a lot of the things that I'm doing and the people that I work with, we're just pulling things from the past. And so if you all recognize any of these people on this picture, you know, starting from my left to right, um, we, we have Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Ella Baker, Nanny Helen Burroughs, uh, W.B. Du Bois. At the bottom, we have uh, Marion Berry, who was the uh, former mayor of DC, and then on, um, the last picture is Ben Burkett, who is um, part of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which is the largest, you know, black uh, farmer cooperative in the country. And so all of these people had different um, ideas and brilliance around building black cooperatives. And so we were doing a lot of reading from the local black cooperative scene, but also the national uh, black cooperative scene to put together what we call Southeast. And so this is, this is Southeast right here. This is just a uh, uh, an overview of what South Eats is and our idea and concept behi behind South Eats was arranged in a way so that um, the business model didn't follow DC. Um, if anybody's been to DC before, you may, you may know or you may not know that DC is very nonprofit centered. So everybody from the Red Cross to um, the NRA, everybody's headquarters, nonprofit headquarters is centered in DC. So not only do we have large national uh, nonprofits, we have the international NGOs, and we have hundreds of local nonprofits. And so nonprofit dollars operate, you know, run everything in DC. And our, our concept was like, hey, how can we move out of the nonprofit context and do something that is has democratic principles, um, or were founded kind of like in equity, and we're doing something, you know, so that it's a non-hierarchical structure. And we decided on, on having a worker on co-op. And so our idea and concept behind Southeast, obviously you can read it here, was we realized that farmers markets in DC and in many lower income communities in the city don't necessarily hit the spot. 
no matter how beautiful, you know, the vegetables or fruit or whatever it is that you get, no matter how beautiful it is, if you don't have the time, if you don't have the knowledge um, to kind of prepare the meals in a form that you can kind of eat, it's not going to do anything for you. And so there's a lot of programs that give people tons of vegetables. If they don't have the time, they don't know how to cook. It's a waste of time. And so we figured that what we could do was already kind of skip that step from you all. You know, we could skip that step, prepare the food. It could already be seasoned. All you have to do is pop it in the oven or put it on the stove, heat it and eat it. We've already done the sourcing for you, kind of working with uh, primarily black farmers within our region, you know, that we're able to source from and put it together. And so we looked at ourselves as like being able to kind of bridge the gap and further build out an ecosystem of, of, of food change and um, food sovereignty. And food sovereignty was the lens that we were really coming from. Um, in DC, there's not too many um, fully black led organizations that are kind of pushing this work forward. There's a lot of black people that do the work, but the, the organizations are not 100% black controlled and kind of rooted in um, listening to the community and following what the community wants. Um, and so this is just uh, myself, oh, man, one of the pictures isn't on there. Myself and in, in the rest of the South Eats team. And um, if you all want to, you can go to uh, southeatscoop.com and check out the website. Um, we were actually supposed to launch in 2020, but we are, you know, COVID slowed us down. So that pushed us back to this year. And so um, we're about to launch in May um, in a few weeks, kind of we've been able to get through the DC government regulatory process and have some good partners, so I'm I'm, fine. I'm really excited, you know, about that. And this is just another example of just the um, what we mean by like the ecosystem. And so, in order for kind of like part of our theory of change or my theory of change, whether it be with South Eats or Soulful, is that it, it takes all of us. And so, it's not just one person um, turning the dial on change, but it's all of us working together, kind of breaking systems down and creating new systems. All right, so this is the Black Dirt Farm Collective. And um, we're, uh, we're uh, this is an amazing group of people who I, I've learned like so many things from and has really changed the way that I view, um, the way I view just everything, the way I view the world. And so I just wanted to share, you know, give a, a quick snippet of, of like, put a, you all can put a face to the name and just dive into kind of what we, what we, what we do with Black Dirt. And so um, I'll read some of this for you because I think some of it is important. Give me one second here. So the black experience in America, in the Americas has always been and always, always will be intimately tied to the land. And a guy named Harry Haywood said that in 1948. And so that's kind of part of the lens that we, we, we were tied to with black dirt. We understand um, that Black farmers in the United States have had a, an abusive relationship with the land. One, um, so much land has been lost or stolen. Black land has been lost or stolen um, since the emancipation and since reconstruction. So that's two. We understand that the current system that we operate on as far as food and agriculture, really, if you think about it, is not that far removed from the plantation system um, that existed You know, when colonizers you know, folks from Europe came over here, um, pretty much eradicated the indigenous people and imported African folks. We're not that far removed. We look at how the systems are, 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 are designed and, and the way the systems operate. And so what we were doing as kind of folks who consider ourselves returning generation, black farmers, returning generation uh, agrarians is we had to figure out a way to have some self-determination. And how do we dis define ourselves? How do we define our own work that we're doing on our own terms. You know, how can we do that? And um, Afroecology was the um, was our articulation of that, right? Afroecology was our articulation of that. And as we were building out Afroecology, we were all deeply involved in the larger um, international agroecology movement. And I know you all are probably familiar with agroecology because I know UVM is plugged in with the agroecology scene. And I recently just took an agroecology class, actually the, the first uh, people's agroecology class, you know, at the university. But so Afroecology is a form of art movement practice and process of social 
an ecological transformation that, evol that involves the reevaluation of our sacred relationships with land, water, air, seeds, and food. We recognize as humans as co-creators that are an aspect of the life's of the planet's life support systems, values the Afro-Indigenous experience of reality and ways of knowing, visibilizes the importance of women and feminine energies as vital to our core collective liberation, cherishes ancestral and communal forms of knowledge, experience, and life ways that began in Africa and continued throughout the diaspora, and is rooted in the agrarian traditions, legacies, and struggles of the Black experience in the Americas. And so with Afroecology, what we've tried to do is develop a, a political education and farmer to farmer experience, very similar to the, uh, the way that agroecology operates. It's very grassroots, it's non-hierarchical, it's exchanges, it's dialogue of knowledges for people who are actually doing the work because we, we kind of already understand and have the understanding that we're the ones that are gonna keep each other safe and we're the ones that have the knowledge, right? And so we have these exchanges. Uh, and so this is a, an example of one of the first um, agroecology, larger agroecology encounters that we had on the Eastern Shore of Maryland that was actually held on Harriet Tubman's ancestral grounds. And just to kind of go back to the beginning when I talked about that triangle and what we were trying to do. So if you all can see my cursor, this guy right here in the middle was the guy Kareem who um, unfortunately was killed in 2020. But this is him kind of being a part of that immersion and getting that, this is, I'm not sure how old he was here. He was, he was, a, uh, he was, he was a young guy, um, but that's him kind of grabbing, kind of getting um, immersed from the ground up in the agrarian and political education of what we consider Afroecology, Afro and agroecology. And so this is, um, I have a video that kind of accompanies this this photo, but um, I didn't add it to it. But this is kind of what we're talking about. So if you can, if you all can imagine, um, this is probably like half the people there, but everybody camping um, in tents and we break out to, into uh, what we call base, base groups and everybody has a team and everybody is, is required to kind of do different things, you know, during our time together. And there was a lot of youth coming from Philly. There was youth from Baltimore. There was youth from DC and there was youth from the Eastern Shore of Maryland that all come together um, to learn these different things. And we had people from Mississippi, from Puerto Rico, from Mexico, um, from Georgia, different parts of Georgia, different parts of Virginia, North Carolina, all kind of in, in attendance um, you know, at this event. And, and it's an example of what we're trying to build out and what we currently do. And so these are like, just going through the, the Afro and agroecology process, these are some of the core learnings that we gained, um, and, you know, through every event, you know, we, we learn more and we make adjustments. And I'm, I'm not going to read all of these, but I, I'll, I'll allow you all to read them and um, kind of, you know, how we um, apply these things to the rural setting and the urban setting. And we always have our encounters on black owned land that's outside of an urban setting. And so we can build that rule, we can, we can bridge that rural urban divide, um, you know, and, and build that out. Yeah. And this is just more learnings from some of the exchangings and, and figuring out other more ways that we can work together, build our, our collective political consciousness and analysis but also building our relationships with each other and also building ourselves up, right? Because going through this life, we all go through different things, different trauma, you know, different forms of trauma. Our, our ways of relating to each other are different. Everybody's personality is different, but it's important that in order to kind of do this work that if we want to change the world, we have to be, um, I think, in the right relationship with ourselves too. And so a lot of it is like self-development and, and growth work, you know? Um, and, and work with each other. So that's a big part of it, um, big part of, of, of the work that, that we, we're, we're doing, we've done, and we're kind of planning to do in the future as, as things hopefully open back up um, post COVID. And so um, this is, uh, I added this slide at the end because I just wanted to, I'm not sure if any of you all are familiar with the people's agroecology process. If you're not, you should definitely look it up. 
my apologies for the grainy photos. We should definitely look up the people's agroecology process um, that Why Hunger put together. But we were a part of, you know, so if you look on here, you have organizations. This is Gail Taylor, who's based out of DC, black woman farmer, amazing person. She's part of Black Dirt. But um, the people's agroecology process was, you know, put together with uh, farmers from up in up in different parts of Canada, Union Paisan. We have organization Boricua down in, in, in Puerto Rico. We, you know, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives was a part of it. Black Dirt Farm was a part of it. And it's almost, um, it was a way to, you know, agroecology comes out of the global South. It's not something that's rooted necessarily in the United States political context, but we, we through, the, through, through the process and, and growing and things spreading, people wanted to figure out a way to, you know, what would it be like to have a, um, a turtle island version of, of agroecology and what, what would that look like? And so the people's agroecology process is the articulation of like five or six years of going to different encounters of people coming to DC, us going to Puerto Rico, folks going to Canada, to New York and working together and building these things out. And so this is just, a, um, we were um, a part of building out, you know, the people's agroecology process and, and building that out. And so I thought I wanted to add that in there just to bring things full or, or bring things around to the larger national and international context of the work we're doing and the work that I do. And so um, the stuff that I get from the people's agroecology process goes back to Southeast and Northeast and Northwest and Southwest DC and vice versa, the things that I'm getting from the community, I might bring it back to a larger national or international gathering of agroecology and trying to build out these bridges. So a kid like Kareem or Mikhail or his brothers have the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico and meet young uh, Boricua farmers who are coming up and they can you know, dialogue and exchange with each other um, and then take those things back to their respective communities. And so I'm not sure how long I've been talking. Um, I tried to make it short because 30 minutes isn't that long. Uh, this is kind of like the, I, I believe this is the last slide. Actually, this is the last slide. Um, I, I like Octavia Butler, I, I read you know, a lot of her books. My father put me onto her many years ago. But this quote, I always stuck with me because so much of my work, um, since when I started back, you know, back in like 2016, 2017, has changed. And I've been fortunate enough to be in many different communities, many different spaces, some that I share, some that I different share, but they all, they all changed me and they changed the way that I do my work. And so um, I just thought this, 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 this quote was, was fitting a good way to kind of put a period at the end of the uh, you know presentation, and I kind of wanted to leave space for I'm um, assuming questions. So that's the end. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for your presentation and uh, perfect timing. So um, I would like to remind everyone. Well, first of all, thank you for attending, uh, and please remember to send your questions in the Q and A. And just to uh, kick off the question session. Well, thank you. Just thank you for sharing um, the stories and these experiences and um, the project that you're talking about seems just amazing and wonderful examples and examples of things that uh, we need to be doing all over the country. And um, I wonder, like maybe it's a more practical question, like people who want to do something similar, now that you've had experience with so many projects, like how do you even start and where where do you begin and how do you have a success story to do something like that and help people rebuild this relationship with land? Yeah, yeah. Um, depending on like, you know, uh, everybody lives in different places, but depending on where you live, I think just start where you are or start where, you know, whatever you see, you, you consider home and connecting with, if you're somebody who's not, you're like out of town or somewhere like that, connecting with the people who have been there longer than you, right? And just kind of learning the research and the history of, you know, said community or said place that you want to you feel like something needs to be done. I'm 100% certain that there's people living there that are already doing something and they've probably been doing it for who knows how long. And there's probably some systemic roadblocks that are blocking them. So just take some time because whatever problem or issue or system you're trying to change, you're not going to be able to change it overnight, right? So give yourself that time and grace to like, tap in and learn 
and build kind of deep relationships with people. And I think once you do that, things will be able to flow. And then from, from, for me, something that I always do and try to do the best is just listen because the people that are on the ground in the community already nine times out of 10 have solutions already cooked up or they had a solution at one point in time. So, yeah. Thank you. I like the uh, listening and the centrality of relationship. It's just so important in all aspects of our work and life. Um, following up on other questions, more questions coming in. Uh, one question we have is, how uh, South Eats meals uh, would reach the community? Uh, would it be sold direct to customer or wholesale? Now that's a great question. So um, like in our business model, as we were building this out and I could like dive deeper into Southeast if, if anybody one-on-one -on -one if they want. So we were building on our business model and we're like a small business. We Our budget is, is pretty tiny. So that was one of the things that we were trying to figure out was that like, I'm, I'm sure y'all are familiar with like some of the, uh, like Blue Apron and some of those other um, larger corporations that do similar stuff. They're at a scale and they have the capital to like, it'll show up on your doorstep in like two days. We can't do that. So we had to figure out a way to build it. So we, we started just in one community in DC called Mayfair. And essentially uh, we did a, like some community organizing and had a, some community meetings and we were gonna set it up. We've set it up like farmer's market style for lack of a better term, or CSA style, that's a better way, like a CSA style where people would pick up the meals and they would get a week's worth of meals um, at one time. And then they can go onto the website uh, and order online um, like a week in advance. And so that's how we set it up. Um, I, I wish we, we could like drop it off, but it's only, you saw the picture of the team. So it's only four of us. We have some younger people that work with us that came through the soilful pipeline, but like, Dropping it off door to door would be that would that would probably break us. Um, so that's you know, and, and we tried to figure out a, a menu that it was a whole bunch of regulatory process, just like with getting food to people. If anybody does food work, you know it's like super regulated. Um, so it's it's a, it's a whole process, and we wanted to be able to accept EBT, and that was the most important thing that if we could if we can't hit the people that are at the bottom of the economic totem pole, and maybe people who get EBT might not even be at the bottom, might be, you know, folks who are homeless or, um, or house insecure that are at the bottom, but we want to get to this, the bottom as we could. So that off that, that's why the meals are not cooked. So, you know, people with EBT can't buy cooked meals. So we tried to think of as much things as possible. I think one benefit to us is because we're a small organization we can't do that much, but we're able to pivot pretty fast. So it's pluses and minuses. We, we can't like deliver to one side of the city or the other, but we can make adjustments pretty fast because, you know, our overhead is relatively low and the area that we're, we're serving, we, we decide to serve is, is relatively small. Yeah. Thank you. Um, more questions are coming in and also a lot of just gratitude and, um, appreciation of the work you do. So next question is, um, in any of your work, do you have partners with universities and researchers in them? And uh, what are some ways that universities or researchers can support the kind of work you do? Yeah, and that's a good question. So uh, part of, for Black Dirt Farm Collective, um, I, I should have added that into the, like a description of Black Dirt Farm Collective. So we have at least like three people that have PhDs, so they they would be considered like researchers or academics, um, and they're more connected to the university system. So we do have that there. Um, but overall, with like the different projects that I'm involved in, I wouldn't say that I have a university partner per se. I think a university partner would be pretty cool. Um, I think it would be like important to figure out like what that kind of relationship is. Um, in the past. I've only worked with universities or, or people from schools have like hit me up like, hey, I have a project due, let me interview you or something like that, where it was kind of like a transactional relationship and we didn't really get to know each other. And once they interviewed me, I like never saw them again. It's like, oh, I didn't even get a chance to see the paper. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think like building more, and because, you know, people who are in school and I, I mean, I have my master's degree. So obviously I've been a student before, but like, you know, they're working on a certain timetable, timeline, and you got to get stuff in at a certain time. And that might not fit my time. You know, my time might be like, I have a long-term vision. So like five, 10 years, 
And he's like, yo, I got to get get this done in like three months. So we got to get it, get it moving. So I think like figuring out, like maybe it might be best working with like professors and working out on a, like a long-term project where it's like, yo, we can build this together and the university can kind of track that Im impact and document that impact and be a part of like the grassroots kind of um, movement building that's happening, not just in like with the little bit of stuff that I do, but it's happening in communities, I'm sure up in Vermont, all over the country, all over the world, it can kind of impact that. And the university might be able to draw down on other forms of money that can help folks that are on the ground doing stuff, you know, and vice versa, the people that are on, in the grassroots who are really applying these ideas and philosophies, you know, that could be bounced up to the, to the academic side. I think agroecology is like a perfect example of that because agroecology is, is, comes from the, from, comes from the you know, people, comes from the peasants, comes from, from, the, from the soil. But right now, if you Google agroecology, it's like super academic-y, you know, um, super, a lot of academics write about agroecology, but, you know, we could probably go to like, I don't know, somewhere in Cuba or Trinidad or Venezuela and talk to, you know, rural farmers about agroecology and they could tell you all types of amazing things that you can't read on the internet. Hopefully that, that, that answered the question. Um, yeah. Thank you. I can relate to a lot of stuff that you're saying, um, just the concerns for research partners. Sometimes we want to work with researchers. I mean, we as researchers want to work with uh, organizations, but we have these constraints and we need to be mindful of them. And um, on the questions of constraints and roadblocks, you mentioned uh, in your presentation systemic roadblocks. They may hinder similar programs. And I wonder if you could elaborate on a couple of common barriers that you've encountered and how you and your collaborators have addressed them. Yes, it's, it's a bunch, but um, so like, for Southeast, for example, so we're essentially like a startup, um, but we wouldn't have been able to start up if we didn't get, we were fellows with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, like the foundation of Johnson & Johnson. Um, and they gave us like some startup capital. So just access to capital, just off the baseline for small businesses and definitely small minority businesses, small black businesses, just access to capital. Like I don't, none of us have an uncle or have even, like we don't even have, you know, some people, if they don't have the money directly, they might be able to ask a friend of a friend or an uncle might be able to throw on some money. You know, none of us have that. So access to capital is one. I think um, in with the picture I showed with the brothers um, from Hustlers the Harvesters, that's in the public housing development called Richardson Dwellings in DC, they call it Clay Terrace. So if you do Google Clay Terrace right now, you will find all types of articles that talk about crime and violence and poverty and all these different types of things. And so, but they wouldn't talk about like, the hundreds of beautiful people that live there, that are living there day to day. But Clay Terrace is like a microcosm of, of you have police, it's pretty much like a mini police state over there. There's police on damn near every corner. There's the access only, I would say that, I mean, there is no closest grocery store to that side of town. There's only two really in that ward of DC, Ward 7, the closest one is maybe like five miles away, maybe a little bit more. Um, so you have food insecurity. Um, I mean, there's definitely, there's no jobs on that side of town. So there's economic, you know, things. I think one of the biggest things that's really not talked about is the mental health stuff that is going on. Because if you can imagine, um, like somebody told me one day, like years ago, that if you can imagine like, you know, soldiers, you know, and this is re with respect to veterans, my pops is a veteran. And you say you go to war, my father was in Vietnam. He fought in Vietnam. You know, he came back from to DC, so he was able to leave. But if you can imagine somebody, you know, uh, in DC, in Clay Terrace, for example, or wherever in DC, if they see their friend, or who, their relative, loved one get get murdered <laughs> by the police or uh, individual, they they most of them, most people cannot live leave the city. So you're re-traumatized on a daily basis, and there's no services, mental health services for people. You know what I'm saying? To, to kind of work through that trauma. So even just the mental health um, and just blockages to like just access to those types of things aren't even talked about. And so you figure people are trying to medicate themselves, whether it's through marijuana or other substances, just to just find a place of peace, you know? And they're criminalized for that, right? Or they have been criminalized for that. Laws have changed now, but they have been historically criminalized for that. So those are just some examples of working through those things because the biggest growing vegetables it's easy. 
being able to work with people is a little bit more difficult and being in a place to really work with people um, in a way where you're trying to build authentic relationships takes time. And it's a, it's a process that, you know, have stop starts and you learn different things and you have to change things around if you want it to be a collective and collaborative process. And these are all things that I've learned from making mistakes and doing it over and over again. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing the experience and the stories. And building off the question on the roadblocks, there's also a question about the relationship between, what, what would the relationship, what has been the relationship between your various organizations and Washington as opposed to DC? Is there interest or support from the wealthy power centers within the district? And are, there, are they paying attention at all? Uh, that's a good question. No, nah, there's no... I, I I was with Climate Justice Alliance and I met Bernie Sanders like a few years ago, but that I, but he does he's not he's not, you know Bernie is cool he's taller than what I thought he would be in real life but he's not um he's not necessarily concerned with like what's happening in D.C. you know like he might not even leave that area of the capital to come on our side of town so I would say there's not really a connection maybe you could say with like the movement of D.C. becoming the 51st state potentially but outside of that. I think you know everybody's is is con, you know more concerned on their individual uh, congressional district or whatever state they come from. So DC is just like it, 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 you know I don't know if like the DC I'm talking about even like it might it might not even exist. You know what I'm saying? Unless you're going out to get something to eat for the most part, or you're riding a bus or on the train or something. What about the those big name NGOs that you were talking about that are also all there? And not, you know, not really. Um, you know, not I, I would, you know, they're they're focused on abroad, so they're not really focused on, on local DC politics. That's not that's not something that they're focused on, at least from my experience. I can't I can't like say it's it's a definite, but from my experience, I haven't had any any connection from like some of those these large, you know organizations, super huge organizations. Um, next question is in a bit of a different um, direction. I love the idea of Afroecology as a deeper paradigm shift. Brilliant. Can you tell us a little more about the Black Dirt Collective? How does one get involved? Yeah, for sure. It's a good question. So uh, we started um, back in mm, maybe like 2015, um, we started back in like 2015, I would say, where it was a lot of us, um, we were going to a farm in Baltimore that this guy had, it was called Five Seeds Farm. And there was a lot of like young black people, like we go out there on Sundays, like plant onions, plant sweet potatoes, like weed. And we were just building on the idea of like, you know, you know, we all getting into this, we like heard like the call of the land, we're all getting into something different. And we figured like, you know, what if we like form a group or something? We're all hanging out. And it just kind of built from there. People in our organization were connected with uh, La Via Campesina. No, they were connected with the Rural Coalition, who was connected with La Via Campesina. And so we were able to make connections with the folks are familiar with the organization called MST in Brazil. Like the landless, uh, it's like landless people's movement. It's like this, like a huge movement of like farmers and like, professional organizers and so we were able to like form these connections with other people um and then we were able to make these connections with older organizations like the 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 federation of southern cooperatives in the in the south like in mississippi and georgia and learn from like the older black farmers and so all this was like happening at the same time we all lived in the mid-atlantic region between between like as far north as i want to say philly and as far south as maybe like North Carolina. And so we were all coming together, like learning, like learning these different things, learning, learning, building, learning. And this is over the span of like five, six, seven years. And um, it came to a point where we started to host like these Afroecology retreats where we would bring in more people and we would have like these, these like teachings and sharing stuff and a little bit of education stuff. And as our networks, as more people kind of came to the organization, our networks grew and we ended up meeting folks from, you know, from Boricua and Puerto Rico and meeting folks from all over, man, all over. And we just exchanging and building. So that's kind of how Black Dirt kind of has, has 
built out historically. Um, then we kind of developed Afroecology and we wanted to have our own kind of Afroecology encounters where people could come. It could be like an experience that you can't get anywhere else. Um, and you could kind of leave with something, not necessarily tangible, but you could leave with something. And so now kind of where we are, you know, COVID slowed us down, but actually um, we were fortunate enough actually like two weeks ago to um, through like, I don't know if anybody's familiar with like seed commons and some of like the non-extractive like loan funds where we were able to kind of uh, collectively like purchase some land, um, um, you know, through, yeah, we could be able to collectively like purchase some land in Southern Maryland. And so now we're kind of building out, we have like a home base because we never really had, we were all landless. We never really had a physical home base. So now we have a home base to kind of build out um, this broader kind of network and movement work and educational work uh, in the mid-Atlantic region because we feel there's a need for, I think, intergenerational work as far as like black farmers. There's a need for, I think, um, an introduction for like people coming, young youth coming from like, like Kareem who I mentioned coming from DC, how can they get out of the city for a little bit and learn something different? There's a need for um, like, if people wanna learn how to farm or learn how we were able to get access to land because we didn't go through a, um, a typical vendor or typical uh, uh, lender, you know, this is how we can, can do it. And then just overall, just a place just to be safe, have fun, party, you know, just do your thing. Um, so we're building out that land base um, but people we're having, so we're going to have a land shower on Juneteenth, which is, uh, Juneteenth is, is, um, is in June, obviously, but we're going to have a, a land shower and we're going to try to have ways that people can kind of donate. Um, we were able to get 24 acres, but we're building out this, you know, building out this space. So um, that's how people can get in, one way that people can get involved. Once uh, COVID, um, we're able to get over COVID, we're going to have more encounters. We're going to have Afroecology encounters, but we're also going to have as a part of the people's agroecology process, there's larger um, agroecology encounters that, you know, I think will, I think it will, uh, we're going to try to put our bid in to be like one of the hosts for the larger agroecology encounters where people from like all over come, folks from Canada come down, Union Paisan and, and different parts of the, of the country come. Um, so we're try and trying to continue to build it out and figure out like, you know, continue just to build. So it's a slow and steady movement, you know, um, you know, I could tell you many stories about the process. It's been a long process. Um, hopefully that answered the question. I, I know I did a lot of talking, but I, I just wanted to get a full context. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize at the beginning that Afroecology was the concept that your organization has introduced. I think that's pretty Yeah, yeah, we, we awesome. came up with that, yeah. Um, you kind of answer parts of this question, but I, I just want to make sure that I, uh, the question will be addressed. Well, first, uh, folks are wishing you good luck with the lunch of South Eats, uh, I guess from, from all of us, from all the attendees. And how many families will be served by the program and how does one become eligible to receive Yeah, that's a good question. So service? we said, um, like, you know, we want to serve as many people as we can, but we don't have the capacity. So we figured like we could serve at a, a max 100 families. That's what we felt we could serve 100 families. And we felt like, if we were able to, if our business model was good enough to um, kind of economic, economically like sustain that with like the revenue and the cash flow, then we could be able to figure out ways to expand. And so if you go to the Southeast website, um, Joelle, our co-founder, she probably took it down or, or changed, it, changed it's www.southeastcoop.com. She may have changed it so you can't like, you could probably sign on to the mailing list, but you can't sign up to become a member just now. And really, to be quite honest with y'all, like we haven't, we ran a pilot in 2019 that went pretty well. 2020, we wanted to launch, but then COVID came and pretty much just like smacked us. And we were like, yo, we can't do anything right now because everything is shut down. It was just, um, our, we're not a nonprofit. And so during the COVID time period in DC, the nonprofits pretty much took over like the food distribution and they were giving out food for free. And ours isn't a free model. And so we knew we couldn't compete with the nonprofit. So we just kind of held back and went on a, um, a internal type of revision type of mode. We we're able to get a little bit more money. We brought in some other people to help us with some regulatory things. In 2021, 
we're like at the very end of, we had to get a HACCP plan if anybody's familiar with that and other, you know, licenses, licenses and stuff like that. So a hundred people um, is, the, is the cap that we're going for right now. You can go to the website um, and learn more about how to sign up. There's really no eligibility. Anybody can sign up, you know, um, you would just have to come to the side of town where the meal distribution is going to be. As I talked about earlier with like building out the network, we're working with another organization, a dope organization in DC called Dreaming Out Loud. They have multiple farmers markets across the city. And so what we're kind of going to try to do is see if um, people can that are, that are part of their farmers markets, if they want to, they can order online and their farmers markets can be additional um, drop off and pick up points, pick up points for food. So just additional distribution points. And that's what we'll probably do is figure out ways to partner with like other organizations who have farmers markets since we don't have the, the capacity to deliver everywhere, but we can figure out ways to just drop off the meals to different places that people have already pre-ordered. So that's where we are right now. Um, it's a process where if something doesn't work, then we're going to change it. Um, so we're not like stuck on any way. We're just trying to find the way that works the best uh, for us. So um, it's been a long, it's been a, like a long, long like process with Southeast and like chipping away at task and all that type of stuff. Well, best of luck and strength to you. I'm gonna uh, ask one last question from a student who is uh, from a, a fellow master student in leadership for sustainability. Uh, they're asking about um, the term Afroecology. Um, and I would love to hear more about the process of creating the term and how it's been evolving for you and for the organization. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's, that's dope. We didn't we were tell Matt, I said, what's up, man? Matt, come. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Afroecology, this was like, this was like early in the Black Dirt days. And we were um, like, when we first started, we were all reading a whole bunch of stuff from like, out of, out of the agroecology space, obviously agroecology has been a long way longer. It's been written about. So we were reading a lot about the agroecology stuff. Simultaneously, we were reading a lot about the our, our, the Black African American agrarian history, right? So we're reading a bunch of that stuff. Then we were like meeting a lot of older, more seasoned, more experienced Black farmers as well. So you're like mixing, and then you add in our own like personal experiences and our own vision of like, well, this is where we are. This is what's going on. This is what's been done. This is like what we're doing. You kind of put all that into a pot and mix it up, mix it up, mix it up, mix it up. And like, that's kind of how Afroecology like comes to being. And we used to like have these gatherings on the Eastern Shore of Maryland where it'd be like 50 of us like one of some of our friends were written this big old house. It's like, <laughs> if you can imagine like you and your homies, like, rent, like they, they stayed in this big house. There's only two of them, but they had like this big old house and had all these different rooms. So you could have like a bunch of people come over and we would have like that, um, that, that stick, that big, those big like sticky paper you can write on the wall and like, you know, people are like throwing out ideas and talking and all that type of stuff. So that's how it kind of process that was like the the foundation of the roots of of how things that was like the seeding process you know when things germinated via us like continuously working with it, with it and then we were like watering it and it grew and us like watering it was like we were learning also so i had the opportunity to go to puerto rico um for agroecology encounter and so seeing how they were doing it in Bodigua. So Bodigua is like a farm organization down there in Puerto Rico, similar to like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. They've been around for a while. They have older members, but I was able to meet the members that were closer to my age. But seeing like how they, uh, how encounters, how, how it's the process of an encounter and what, what that meant for different farmers from the island coming together, the exchange and the dialogue. We had members in Black Dirt who went to Brazil with the MST folks and were able to uh, participate in some of their encounters, right? And then we had m people from uh, BDFC that went to um, encounters like in different parts of the United States. And so we were kind of bringing all this together and figuring out, yo, this doesn't exist for our generation of like African-American farmers. Like how could we recreate a similar experience, put our own flavor on it, our own ideas and concepts on it, but kind of it comes from the same root. 
And so that's where we kind of developed the Afroecology encounters that were strictly for like black agrarians or people who were working with the land. So you could kind of really build up because we realized there's no real like pipeline. There's a lot of pipelines for people to learn how to farm. You know what I'm saying? Beginner farmer training programs, there's conferences, NOFA, you got all types of conferences, you know what I'm saying? CASA, PASA, all types of drinks. And so, but there's no ones that, you know, add the cultural context into it that, that are, you know, add the political context into it, add the spiritual context into it. And so that's what we wanted to, and none of them, you're camping, we, we're camping too. So none of them are camping. They have good food, they have music, they have, you know, you can bring your kids to. It's a real, we try to make it as holistic as possible. So you can kind of bring, you know, bring your full self to the space because your full self is needed for the work. You know what I mean? You can't leave a piece of yourself behind. You have to show up as your full self and that's what we need. And so that's what we've, we've, we've been created, the, the, the times that we've done the encounters. Um, and so we wanted to have an encounter last year. And so uh, we got to the point where we were having like these intergenerational encounters with like adults and youth. And then the, the part where we were just having like youth encounters. So we were having like two of them at the same time. And so, and then you have your larger like agroecology encounters. So it's really like three encounters if that makes sense. So the larger agroecology encounters are from people from like all over. So like all over, they're, they're damn near all over. You know what I'm saying? Wherever the reach of agroecology is, they, they'll come into whatever given location. And the agroecology encounters are just for like the black farmers and they're intergenerational. The youth encounters are for youth coming out of like urban cities, mainly up and down the Eastern Seaboard, Mid-Atlantic regions. And so those are like the three things we've done. We've become pretty good at like putting them together. Um, and so we're working to kind of, as we, since we've, we're making like a, a pivot because we've, we've gotten this land and we've kind of, all of us are through our collective wisdom, we've understanding that there's some things that through our process we've gone through internally, working through issues and stuff like that, and seeing other issues that there's things that are missing and we can kind of still add to like what, you know, what ag Afroecology is, but also like what the future can be, um, you know, whatever, whatever that is. So uh, hopefully that ans answers the question. If anybody wants to know more, we could definitely like chop it up and talk more about it. You can ask as many questions as you want. That's actually a perfect way um, to wrap up and segue into the very quick last question. Basically, folks would like to stay connected and uh, just keep up with your work or help spread the word. And so they were asking about uh, social media outlets that you have. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I have social media, but I, I, it's, it's hard for me to always post. Remember to post on social media, you know what I'm saying? But um, so you can follow me, I guess, at Soulful, um, S-O-I-L-F-U-L. That's on Instagram. Black Dirt Farm Collective has an Instagram that's called, um, it's probably the Black Dirt Farm, I'm sure it's, it's the Black Dirt Farm Collective on IG, but we haven't, um, we haven't posted anything on there in a while. But those two, those two um, are two, like the social, Southeast has an Instagram too that we haven't posted on as of yet. Um, because to be honest with y'all, we haven't even shared Southeast with the larger DC. So only like a handful of people. So y'all like some of the first people really know about Southeast. We didn't want to really share until we had our ducks in a row. So the, in the office, the email, um, Tatiana can share the email. Anybody want to send me an email or something? Um, and then you can kind of tap into the Black Dirt Farm. The people in Black Dirt Farm Collective, outside of just being members of the collective, everybody has their own individual projects that they're working on. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, if anybody's like likes rap music, it's like the Wu-Tang Clan or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like Wu-Tang. Everybody comes together and they form the Wu-Tang, but everybody has their individual albums they're working on. That's like the, a good analogy, if anybody, hopefully somebody catches that analogy. But um, so yeah, so anybody can hit me up. I would love to stay connected um, and continue to build with folks. And if anybody's in DC um, and wants to tap in one day, just, um, just holler at me. Uh, folks are commenting and calling your analogy genius. Okay. So I think that's an excellent okay. way to wrap up. And thank you for your time. On behalf of the Gantt Institute, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and also everyone who joined us online today. We'll have the video and post podcast of today's talk available next week. And we hope you please join us next Friday uh, for the next Gantt Exchange with Anila Jacob from USAID Integrated Natural Resources Management, whose talk 
perspectives on integrating biodiversity conservation with broader global development program at USAID will be next Friday, uh, May 7th. All right, y'all. Thank you for having me. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Thanks, everyone.